you may be aware, and I know that literally tens of thousands of you have listened uh, to uh, the interview I did with Brendan O'Neill from Spiked Online earlier this week. It has had huge hits and massive hundreds and hundreds of comments and reaction. We published the column um, which sparked that interview, a column about the Prime Minister's speech during her recent visit to the United Nations, a speech which has made headlines around the globe. The Times, The Washington Post, The Guardian, um, journalists and commentators, uh, Sky News Australia is all over it, The Australian is all over it. This speech by the Prime Minister in which she described people talking to each other as a weapon of war that needed to be stopped by some sort of alliance between Silicon Valley um, big tech companies and governments around the world. That speech has sent shockwaves around the world. It has been widely reported and generally not in glowing terms. It has been described as worrying, disturbing, authoritarian. But you know what? If you were sitting here in New Zealand relying on your legacy mainstream media, and if you didn't have outfits like the platform, you wouldn't know that speech had ever taken place because it was, it seems to me, willfully ignored by the acolytes that pass for political journalists and mainstream commentators in this country. So A, why is that? And B, why have others, including like, like liberal journalists like um, Glenn Greenwald, why have they said what Jacinda Ardern said was damaging and dangerous? Um, and what has happened to us in this country that we do not cover stories like that or we are blissfully unaware. To discuss this, because I think at the core of the Prime Minister's speech and at the core of the international media concern about that speech is the issue of free speech. So we are joined now uh, from the Free Speech Union by Jonathan uh, Ailing. Jonathan, welcome to the program, uh, to the platform, and lovely to have you with us again. Thanks very much, Sean. Would you agree with my premise that domestically within New Zealand, this speech has been largely ignored by our established news media? Oh, absolutely. And, and I think that's quite surprising given, as you've covered, the, the waves it's made internationally. It's certainly, uh, you know, Jacinda's just, just fawned over by, by many overseas. Uh, and, and yet we've seen both in the United States and in the United Kingdom, even those that would usually be uh, very in favour of her policies, uh, uh, you know, surprised at, at, at the comments that she made in, in such an international forum there. So, so one way or the other, whether you like it or not, we haven't really heard boo uh, from from media here in New Zealand, and, and I think that's um, surprising. Mm. Jonathan, what do you think it is about the speech that has provoked the reaction overseas that it's got? I wonder if we have just gotten used to these being the, the key issues that we're having to fight for in New Zealand at the moment. And, and yet when, it, when we go overseas, People are used to the Prime Minister being quite so blatant in her liberal authoritarianism. And, and I think it's an interesting construction of terms because it's actually an oxymoron, a contradiction to be, to be both liberal and authoritarian. But I think this is uh, the way the Prime Minister has indicated that she really intends to operate with regards to these big questions to, to kind of keep human rights and, 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 and liberal ideas in mind, but then to package that in, in a very government controlling way, which is then authoritarian. And, and that flies in the face of uh, many of the major political modus operandi internationally. And so I think maybe uh, we've, been, uh, we've been slowly, you know, the, the, the pot in the boiling kettle type illustration, we've been slowly made um, uh, used to this, where the rest of the world, this is still quite a shocking way to construct these issues. Um, I don't know if you heard my interview with Brendan O'Neill. I did suggest to him that maybe we are... New Zealand is the petri dish for those who have these ideas of liberal authoritarianism uh, and control. Maybe New Zealand is, is the wee 
social laboratory where these ideas of thought police and control of narrative um, can be tried out. Absolutely. And, and I, did, I did listen to that uh, interview there, Sean. I, I think a, a really interesting uh, dialogue in the way that these issues are impacting different countries around the world. And, and I don't think it's salacious in any way to say that different leaders are talking to each other and they're looking at how things are going in their countries. And, and in New Zealand, we have pursued a particular set of policies within a context that has had a terrorist attack, that, is, that has had a very strong response to COVID. I think different leaders around the world are interested in uh, the, the, the set of policies and censorship that, that uh, the Labour government is setting out to advance. That's not conspiratorial to claim at all. Equally, uh, you know, uh, uh, the the newly elected prime minister in Italy uh, is is being watched by others to see how her policies go. So I definitely think New Zealand is uh, uh, making waves, and people are going. Well, let's see how it plays out there, and that's why our fight for free speech is so important in this country because it is actually going to have implications. I think around the Anglosphere, so the other the other. Um, developed English-speaking countries and more broadly than that as well. Mm. Uh, Jonathan, there are obviously similar groups like yours uh, in other places uh, around the world, in Britain, in the US, and in, in Australia. Are they concerned too if you talk to your colleagues or your fellow travellers in similar organisations elsewhere? I was uh, actually speaking at a conference in Manila last week, uh, Sean, and, 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 and as I came back, I had people there talking and saying, oh, your Prime Minister Jacinda, she isn't that bad, isn't it? You guys are actually quite free down there in terms of speech. And then this speech came out just as I was returning and it set a totally different tone to much of this discussion in their minds. Absolutely, we've had a lot of our supporters uh, and, 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 and colleagues internationally contacting us going, uh, this cannot be true. And as you say, the Free Speech Union actually exists in, in all of the Anglosphere countries apart from Australia at the moment where one is, is uh, perhaps going to be set up before too long. And I think that indicates the common problem that exists across the Anglosphere and across the West. And so to see these comments being made at, of all places at the United Nations, uh, I think it'll be interesting to see whether this actually galvanizes a response that actually is dedicated, regardless of politics, regardless of the specifics of policies, to the idea that words are not weapons of war, words are the opposite of weapons of war. And I think that's well, one of the great perverse ironies here is that words are what people use when they don't resort to violence, when they don't actually get into conflicts with each other, they go to the ideas that are at play. And I think it's, it's very pernicious for us to try and take words off the table because you know what, Prime Minister, the only thing you're left with then if you take our words away is action. And, and that's the, the really concerning thing, I think, with many of the comments that are at play here is that the last thing it does is moderate discussion. It increases polarisation. It pushes people further and further apart from the subjects that they can dialogue on. And that means ultimately, whether violent or not, it, it, it means we, we're left with only action being the option for us to continue to take. And so I think the Prime Minister needs to think very carefully about, you know... I don't, I don't disagree at one level that misinformation or disinformation are problems. They, they, they can... Well, they they're can not good things. Stuff. They've existed always. No. Yeah. No, yeah. but, 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 but I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned by the government's misinformation at the moment than anyone else's. And so the, the age-old problem of who gets to define this comes up, and the only way we get to assess that and to deliberate that is through dialogue. And if she takes that off the table, I'm not sure what we have left. Yeah. Should we be surprised, though? I go back to the Harvard commencement speech, which the Prime Minister gave on her first trip out of the country post-COVID, and that speech vilified and marginalised through personal invective people who disagreed with the Prime Minister. And once again, mm. it was covered in glowing terms by an acquiescent New Zealand media. But in fact, it was mm. a hate speech. 
Yes, and, and I think uh, the, the issue that the Prime Minister try, is trying to address here uh, around misinformation, disinformation, regulation of speech on social media, be, be, because, you know, they are very complex. I think they are one of the most difficult public policy areas at the moment. And so, in a way, I think she's almost set her sights on this being her legacy, following Christchurch, following, you know, the, the hate that is obviously rampant in New Zealand. You and I both know this, and, and the, the oppression that constantly exists because of people's words. Uh, she's decided that that's going to be one of the parts of her legacy to try and fix. And so I think this is something she's going to continue to work away at. And, and, and sure, I wouldn't expect many of your listeners to be aware of, of, of these other projects bec- because they've gone under the radar so much. But things like the content regulation reform, which is being uh, overseen by Minister Tenetti right now, this is, this is a package that is about to go out to public uh, consultation that is going to in- restructure the entire censorship regime in New Zealand. And uh, we haven't heard really anything about this. Now, it, it has been public. I'm not saying it's, it's all been hidden away, but it's not been covered at all. And, and the average Joe has never heard of it once. Mm. And yet it's changing. Each of the pillars of censorship in New Zealand is working. In, you know, I think the Prime Minister's comments are signalling to an announcement that is coming very soon that will be outworked with, with Minister Tanetti and, and others, uh, such as the Justice Minister, to, to reinitiate hate, uh, hate speech discussions, uh, to, to uh, release the legislation on that issue. And so uh, we're, we're seeing uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the right noises being made internationally to justify these steps domestically. But the average person here hasn't been brought along in that conversation. Mm. And so I think... So you're saying this is a precursor to a new assault on free speech in New Zealand? Absolutely. I I think we have several steps coming, uh, you know, before the end of the year, beginning of next year, as we head into the election uh, next year, that, that, that will require real resilience for those of us that love free speech, and despite our, our you know, diverse backgrounds, our different politics, for those of us who agree that, that speech is actually the way we move these conversations forward, there's going to be a few fights on our hands before yeah. long. And already a lot of prep work has been done. I look at shady and secretive groups like the Disinformation Project who are only going to engage with media who are completely in their thrall. I look at groups like Paparoa, Action Station... They are all part of a pattern of behaviour from this government and administration that is priming the pump for these sorts of changes. That's exactly right. These are safe ideological births, really, for their people to hide away in and cushy jobs and, 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 and have the air of authority to tell us that, uh, that language and speech are the greatest threats of our time. It's an incredibly pernicious thing that is, that is I believe, one of the greatest threats to our democracy in the West. Mm. And, and yet, again, we see very little concern from it from those who, frankly, should know better. And the news and media so, should be uh, doing their job. I'm also going to say that, apart perhaps from the exception of ACT, I see very little concern or coverage of this or reaction to this from parties like National and other political parties who also have much to lose in a world of, you know, thought, please? I think it's very fear. And uh, I would say that the reason for that is from a political calculus, the fact that the average person actually, um, if anything, maybe agrees with Jacinda, but more than anything, doesn't care. And that's the problem at play here is while I'm concerned about the media or the government or our universities, these are structural problems in terms of our fight for free speech. The biggest issue is the fact that we do not have a culture in New Zealand where the average person believes that without the right to make their case, they will be at a loss. And and this is the whole, well, actually, you know, words can do a lot of harm, so we've got to be really careful in all this pearl clutching that occurs that, you know, in the main is correct, but it puts such an emphasis on the harm that words can allegedly do that actually we don't stand up for the fact that they are the way 
the greatest uh, rights have been established and the greatest progress has been made. And so I agree. I think a national needs to do more to stand in this space, to make very strong lines clear that they will not cross uh, if and when they are re-elected to government eventually. But the problem is we actually need to work to create a culture that demands from their politicians and from their leaders a greater respect for speech rights. Is it also possible, Jonathan, and I'll throw this idea out there, um, is it also possible that really this isn't a domestic issue, this is the Prime Minister laying the groundwork for her ascension to the world stage? Oh, that's probably above my pay grade. I, I that, that that may be true. I, I would say I think she's already done a lot of that legwork and, and laid a lot of that foundation. So uh, if if that is what's at play here, Sean, uh, I think it may have been a miscalculation in that in many ways I don't think the speech went down the way she thought it would. Uh, and, and like I say, because of the presence of, of the Free Speech Union and, and the number of countries now and, uh, and other work, uh, groups working in the space like this, I think she will find that over the next two or three years, this issue becomes harder to push rather than easier. And so uh, if that is what she's going after, she may have made the wrong choice. All right, Jonathan, I do want to ask you too about your organisation. Have you found, have you had an increase in membership? Are people getting into these things more or is it still a slow burn? Oh, oh, Sean, I, I think the, uh, the uh, New Zealand average person is, is waking up to the fact that the foundations of their liberal democracy are, are being undermined daily and so you know we've been around as a union for 18 months we went from 4,000 supporters in uh in, in june last year to 44,000 supporters five weeks later uh after the hate speech laws and we're now uh, up at about 80,000 supporters a year following that so at, at this rate um we'll, 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 we'll be a quarter of a million before long and <laughs> that may be a little bit ambitious but I, I definitely think that because of the broad appeal, we're not telling them what issues to care about. We're not telling them that they have to think from this political perspective or that political perspective. Uh, we work with those that um, otherwise I entirely disagree with. But yeah. we believe that speech and dialogue are the way forward. And I think that's a very Kiwi way of thinking about things, that, that actually you get to have your say, I get to have my say, and then we'll make up our own minds. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. You don't get to tell me what to think. and. Yeah, absolutely certain yeah. the government doesn't get to Yeah, and look, I'd make this observation. Last week, I raised some issues about a word and how we use that word and why it might not be used in the context of this, and this was the word terrorist or mass murderer, a semantic maybe argument, I thought an important one. Um, and the response to that was that a major news organisation here literally attempted to have the platform cancelled and to get mm. politicians to say they wouldn't talk to us. I, mm. I, I was pretty stunned um, by that hit job a and stunned that the news media or any new serious news media organisation would do it. Um, we've talked about the coverage of this or the lack of coverage of this speech here. If you could sit down with the editors of all the big legacy dinosaur media in New Zealand, what would you say to them? What advice might you proffer to them, Jonathan? How do you think you're going to fare when the government gets to control what stories are told and they're not told. How, how do you think you're going to go in your organisation when hate speech laws limit exactly which sides of the stories you can tell? I, I, I just think it's remarkably short-sighted for, like we said before, for political parties with national, but certainly for people who make their bread and butter out of spinning words I just don't see how they can't be more concerned by this, you know? And, and I would say overall, when, when people are out there, Sean, trying to cancel your program, uh, you know, the, the, the quote we often use at the Free Speech Union is, he who establishes his argument by noise shows that his reason is weak. And I think these people that are going out there and just trying to use blunt force to push the other side out of what can be considered reasonable discussion fails to use their reason to actually convince and persuade. And it's a very short-term uh, strategy to try and win people on board with that. And that's why, in Congress, 
Our strategy is long term. Over the next 10 years, we want to persuade people that the, the peace and stability and prosperity of our nation depend on people being allowed to make their case. And so we, we, we're not going to force anyone to think that, but we will persuade. And every successful cause is founded on reason. And so I think the editors uh, around this nation, you know, I, I do wonder if a few of them are starting to be more concerned. And, and between you and me, Sean, I think um, I've had a suspicion for a while that the, the prime minister and a number of her policies have been built up by the media to such an extent that they can relish in uh, one day tearing her down as well. And this creates the dramatic... Oh, yeah, the worm, the worm does occasionally turn, doesn't it, Jonathan? Jonathan, that and, and has so been... I, a, I, yeah, yep, carry on. I, I wonder what sort of pleasure they will also take in removing her from the heights that she's had. But unless they're buying into a culture that, that accepts the need for dialogue, none of us benefit from it anyway. Uh, Jonathan, uh, lovely uh, conversation, really interesting. I thank you for your time this morning. Um, uh, that was certainly a contribution to the debate about free speech and freedoms uh, in this country. Uh, have a great day. That is Jonathan Ayling, head of the Free Speech Union. Um, and some perspectives there that you might not hear uh, elsewhere. A lot of people asking, what is the group Paparoa? Paparoa is supposedly a group that fights online extremism. I think it's funded out of Silicon Valley. It helps people, so-called journalists like Paddy Gower, with their research when they're trying to find Nazis and white supremacists. It's pretty shady, Paparoa. Um, and it is hard to find much information. All these things are NGOs, not-for-profits, funded by donations. They aren't. They're funded by big trusts who have political ideals. A bit like uh, the Disinformation Project will not talk to us, don't want us to know how they work and uh, how they work in with the Prime Minister, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Um, gosh, we're going to have that interview up. I, 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 look, not blowing his trumpet, I think John, what Jonathan had to say for New Zealanders was as relevant and important as what Brendan O'Neill had to say. But make no mistake, folks, Jacinda Ardern is causing concern around the world, not so you'd read it in our newspapers or see that on our television uh, screens. Uh, this text from Ro, excellent interview with Jonathan. Thanks, so lucky we have the Free Speech Union. The fight to retain free speech under this authoritarian government is going to be a huge one. I could not agree with you more.